So on to tonight, we are so pleased to welcome back uh, James Warner Wallace to The Ohio State University. He was here actually back in 2013. Was anybody there for that? Anybody in this room? Ooh, we do have some second time people here. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Wallace's popularity and demand uh, has just gone up since then. Uh, if you ever check his speaking schedule, he is really an in-demand speaker. I mean, he is uh, all over the place and he's been on Dateline in 2020 and He's a former cold case detective that uh, has a very, very unique approach to investigating evidence and the truth claims of Christianity. And these are three books that we have brought tonight of his that we're selling only for $10 tonight. Wow, we've already sold actually most of them. I th we have some more to pull open in the back. But Jim is, uh, uh, Mr. Wallace is willing to sell these to us tonight for $10 each. So you've got God's crime scene. Uh, this is more about just the overall existence of God. There's all kinds of arguments for God in this book. And then you have his famous book, Cold Case Christianity, which focuses mostly on the reliability of the Gospels, uh, mostly history here. And then a really unique uh, book that he has called Forensic Faith, which kind of gets all of us to think about how we can become case makers for what we believe. And this is where he kind of encourages and exhorts us to know uh, why we need to have an evidential-based faith. And so I encourage you to check out these books in the back, and please uh, check him out. His website, coldcasechristianity.com. Uh, he writes tons of articles, and uh, he was just here in Columbus back in July for a conference, and we all, some of us saw him there as well. But having said that, tonight, uh, Jim, are you sure uh, you just want to spend a little time giving your personal testimony tonight? Oh, just kidding. Anyway, that's an inside joke between me and him and some other people. But we are so happy to welcome back James Warner Wallace to The Ohio State University. I, I feel kind of bad. I feel kind of bad that uh, we didn't. Uh, am I still? Uh, we're going to adjust this microphone. Great. Okay. I feel bad for those of you who saw me in July because they asked me to come and do the exact same talk I did in July at your church. So just rewind and pretend you didn't hear it, okay? <laughs> what we're going to talk about tonight is something that I get asked a lot about because I've been working in Los Angeles County, uh, working cold case homicides. I still have two open cases, and someday I have to go back, maybe in January, and try to finish the two cases I have left. And I've been working these are just unsolved homicides because the only case that goes cold is a homicide. In other words, we don't have, um, if you'll do a robbery or a theft, that case will eventually close because there's a statute of limitations for those crimes. But there is no statute of limitations on murder, so these things stay open. And so my cases range from about 1972 to about 1988, 90, maybe. So these are just the unsolved, the ones that we put in a red notebook and we eventually have to pull out and deal with them. And as I've worked through these cases, I've thought a lot about something we call the problem of evil, right? Because every one of these is pretty horrific. And if you look at how the, the details, especially the families who have suffered a loss and then have waited for years to get justice, and maybe this didn't even get worked for years, th that's the thing that I usually get involved in. So I wanted to share with you some things that I've learned that I've had to wrestle with myself because I wasn't always a believer. I became a believer around 35. Um, I looked at the evidence for the, for the reliability of the scriptures. We're not going to talk about that tonight. But, but at that point, I started to kind of rethink the way I saw the problem of evil. And I've written about it in a book called God's Crime Scene, but I'm not here to sell you this book. I'm here to help you think clearly from another book, which is this one. We're going to do a little Death Scenes 101, okay? I'm going to teach you how to work Death Scenes because I think this tells us something about God's existence, if God does exist. So let's just do a Death Scene together. We're going to look at a, a dead guy laying on the floor. So here he is. Now, the question is, is this a murder? Should I work it as a murder? Or is this just another kind of death? There are four ways to die, and the first three are not criminal. You could die a number of ways. Now, what I have so far is I just have a dead guy laying face down. How am I going to determine how he died? I'm going to use a process called abductive reasoning which I think works quite well if we're trying to determine other kinds of historical truths, too. But what we do is we make two lists that begin with an E. The first list is a list of evidences, and the next list is a list of explanations, ways to explain the evidence. So, so far, evidentially, all we have is a dead guy laying face down. Well, how do you explain dead guys laying face down? Well, there are four ways. Can you imagine how you might explain a dead guy laying face down? 
Natural death, that's, that's very good. Natural death is one of those ways. Also, he might have died by some accident. Or he might have committed suicide. And the last one, of course, would be that he was murdered. I only care if it's this one. If I get there and it's one of these first three, I get to go home. So I'm really hoping it's one of those first three, right? And I want to figure out quickly whether I'm stuck here all night. So I have to figure out, okay, so given what the evidence we have so far, a dead guy laying face down, which of these explanations can I cross off? Suicide? Well, if he intentionally took too many pills, he would look like that. If he accidentally took too many pills, he would look like that. If he just had a heart attack, naturally, he'd look like that. If I poisoned him with too many pills, he'd look like that. So you see, right now, I cannot cross out anything because every possible explanation is still reasonable. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care about possible. I only care about reasonable. Anything and everything is possible. So if you ask me, isn't it possible X, I will always say yes. Because anything's possible. It's possible we were imagining this whole thing. This whole day could have been a, a, a dream. You could still be in bed, dreaming the entire day. Uh, this could be the Matrix. You just haven't taken the pill yet. <laughs> this could be, some people believe our entire universe is nothing more than a computer simulation. So all of this may not be, but that's not, that's possible. But you know, that's why the standard of proof is not beyond a possible doubt, because you'd never get there. You'd never convict anybody. The standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is much lower than possible, because that's the standard we're trying to make. Anything is possible, but not everything is reasonable. Make sense? Right now, I can't cross out anything, though. So let's go back to our scenario and change it. What if he's a dead guy laying face down, but now he's in a pool of his own blood, center torso? That would change things. We have to add that dimension to our list of evidences. So let's do that right now. So now we've got a pool of blood. He's laying face down. What can I cross out? Well, if he had like a, uh, a brain aneurysm, hits the deck, and he bleeds out through his nose. Well, if that was the case, the blood would be over here, right? I'm trying to figure out what natural part of your upper torso you could bleed from. It's possible it's a natural, but I don't think it's reasonable, so I can cross that one out. Can I cross out anything else? Not really. I've got to kind of roll him over and see what the injury is, right? So let's go back and change our scenario. Now he's a dead guy laying face down in a pool of his own blood, but he's got a single gunshot wound in his torso, and it's an exit wound coming out of his back. Hmm, that changes things. Let's go back to our list. I can now add this to the list. Oh, oh, back up. What can I cross out now? I can cross out accidental? What if he didn't know the gun was loaded? He handles it and he shoots himself. That's an exit wound. Got to leave that in. I think I got to leave suicide in too, right? He could shoot himself that way. You might think, well, who would shoot himself that way? Well, look, a lot of the suicides we get to go to are people who are high when they commit the suicide. You see all kinds of crazy suicides. I got to leave that in. I think I got to leave in homicide. Can't change anything. But what if laying next to his body, there is a note, a suicide note, written in his own handwriting on a piece of paper we find elsewhere in the room. With a pen, we find similar pens in the room. It's only got his DNA on it, skin cell transfer. It's only got his fingerprints on it, and it's laying right next to the body. Would that change things? I think it would. Let's put that on our list. Can I cross out anything now? Yeah, I mean, he may have accidentally killed himself before he intended to kill himself, but it looks like he intended to kill himself, right? So I can now cross that out. So now, it's a suicide, right? Okay, who said not necessarily? You've seen this presentation at your church. No, you weren't there that day, were you? It's got a suicide note laying on the floor. It's in his own handwriting. It's his fingerprints, his paper. Doesn't matter. So how did this happen? Someone forced him to write his own, because you've been watching Criminal Minds, <laughs> which is a stupid show. People in this room have done homicides. That is nothing like the way we do a homicide, OK? So if you're watching that stuff, yeah, no, please. All right, let's go back to our scenario for a second here. And since you people are so suspicious, let's make it clear. What if he had, instead of a single gunshot wound, what if he had multiple gunshot wounds to his back? 
And what if they were entry wounds, not exit wounds? What if, what if there was on the note, we look for the note, there's no other paper like that anywhere in the room. There's no other uh, pen anywhere in the room like that. It's, it's not his handwriting. And it's not his fingerprints on that. It's an unknown. That would change things, don't you think? What if there was bloody footprints leading out of the room? <laughs> now we're on the same page, right? Okay, so let's put that in. Here's our scenario. These are now all entry wounds. There's your note now with foreign fingerprints on. I got, this is clearly a California murder. You can see right there. <laughs> that is the beach out there, I'm sure. So now we've got to add this to our list. And after adding this to the list, can you see that given what we have in the room, the evidence, now we have only one reasonable explanation. The other three are certainly still possible, but they're not reasonable. And this is what we do in every homicide investigation, right? We start off with a list of evidences in the room. And this is what we ask every jury to do when they're assessing our case versus the case offered by the defense. We are saying which of these explanations uh, is best most reasonable. This is called abductive reasoning. We've also done something else here that I'm not sure you saw. I'm going to point it out to you. And it's a simple trick. I call it inside or outside the room. Here's how we do it. We say to ourselves, can I explain everything that's in the room by staying in the room? If I can, this is probably not a homicide. Make sense? Let me show it to you visually. So instead of having this room, we'll make it something clear, like a little box. So there he is. Now the question is, can I explain everything that's in the room by staying in the room? Let's try it. Let's say, for example, this note has got his handwriting on it, his fingerprints on it. It's on paper that I find elsewhere in the room. It's on the pen that I find elsewhere in the room. I don't need to go outside the room in order to explain how that got there. He's in the room with the note. It's all his fingerprints. It's his paper. It's his handwriting. I can now explain the note by staying inside the room. And I talk to somebody, and they say, yeah, that's his gun. He's owned it for years. He keeps it in the safe in the corner of the room. And he's, you know, he's a really, you know, he's, he loves that gun. He's had it for years. And sure enough, it's registered to him, and it's only got his skin cell transfer on it. I mean, it's basically, it's his gun. Now I can explain the gun by staying inside the room. And anyone can shoot themselves once without any help from anyone outside the room. So I can even explain the single gunshot wound by staying inside the room. And if this is the case, it's going to be one of these three. Of course, it's not going to be a natural. In this case, it would be an accidental or a suicide. Because everything I need to cause this crime is in the room with him. He can explain all of it. Now, if on the other hand, the best explanation is outside the room. So if, say, for example, I look at that note, and that note does not have his fingerprints on it, doesn't have his skin cell transfer, it's not his handwriting, it's a foreign piece of paper I cannot even place anywhere else in the room. Well, now i got to go outside the room to figure out whose DNA that is, whose fingerprints are those, where'd that paper come from. And, if, you know, let's say they say, oh, no, he's afraid of guns. He's never owned a gun. He would never even touch a gun. And sure enough, the numbers have been scratched off this gun, and then it doesn't have any of his transfer on it. It's, it's basically an unknown weapon that's never been seen by anybody who lives there, and I have no idea where it came from, so now I've got to go outside the room to fi figure out where that came from. And it's kind of hard to shoot yourself multiple times in the back without some help. Better explanation is that someone else did that. And finally, I've got footprints that lead outside the room. Clearly, that's the best explained by a cause outside the room. Now, everything shifts once the stuff inside the room has an outside cause. Now, I have to consider homicide. Why? Because I now have evidence of an intruder. And intruders change everything. In fact, it's intruders that turn death scenes into crime scenes. It's intruders that turn that sense of curiosity you might have about why somebody would kill themselves or how they could die accidentally into a sense of urgency because the only show on TV that kind of gets it right, it's a boring show. Have you guys ever seen it? It's called The First 48. Have you guys ever seen that? I mean, it's, it's pretty cut and dry, right? But it's just a guy with a camera who's falling around detectives in the first 48 hours. The longer we wait, the harder it is to solve it. So this is a, a process that I use in every death scene to determine if it's a crime scene. And I was about 35 years old when I first started considering whether or not God existed. And I thought, couldn't I take a similar approach to the existence of God? In other words, what if the room under consideration was not a death scene, but was just the entire 
natural, physical universe. Could I play the same game of inside or outside? In other words, could I explain everything that's in the room by staying in the room? I see stuff in the universe. We all experience uh, life in the universe. And we all have certain characteristics of the universe we have to explain. The question is, can I explain them by staying inside the room? In other words, all I can use that's in the room is what's available to me under naturalism, which is just space, time, matter, the laws of physics and chemistry that govern space, time, and matter. That's it. I've got to figure out a way to explain everything in the room by just staying inside the room for an explanation. And I think there are a number of things we have to explain. We have to first explain how the room got here. Because we know from science, not from theology, that everything in the universe, all space, time, and matter, came into existence from nothing. And that's really caused physicists to try to redefine what nothing is. Because if it came from nothing, it means it didn't come from space, time, and matter. Those things did not exist until the universe began to exist. We know what nothing is philosophically. Nothing is the stuff that Aristotle says it's the stuff that rocks dream about. Nothing. <laughs> but that means if we're looking for a cause of all space, time, and matter, it has to be something that's not made of space, time, or matter because that wasn't available until the universe came into existence. We're looking for a non-spatial, immaterial, atemporal first cause. But that means we're already outside the room of, naturalist, of naturalism just to get the first answer. But forget that for now. We also have to explain the fine-tuning of the universe, why the cosmological constants are tuned so precisely that any small variation in those constants will not even uh, pr produce a, a universe that can sustain itself, let alone life in the universe. Also, we have to explain how life emerges from non-life in the universe. We have to explain the, D the code in the DNA. We also have to explain why biological life has the appearance of design. That's a rather non-controversial statement. Even Richard Dawkins agrees that there is the appearance of design in biology. The question is, how do we explain the appearance of design? And we are thinking about this using our conscious minds. But if we are uh, atheists, as I was, I don't know how I could account for the immaterial thing we call consciousness when I only believe that everything in the universe came through a series of physical processes. I can believe in a brain, but like Sam Harris, the, uh, the, astro, the uh, neurophysicist, uh, neuroscientist, who is also a, a philosopher, he does not believe we have minds, he believes we have brains, and the mind is an illusion. But the problem with that, of course, is that if we only have physical brains, then all of our decisions are not really freely made. They are simply the consequence of prior physical events like dominoes that fall neurons that fire. So Sam not only denies mind, he also denies the kind of free agency that we all experience. He thinks that's also an illusion. But we have evidence of this. We have our own common experience of it. And finally, we have to talk about how it is we believe that some things are morally good or morally bad. And we also have to explain the problem of evil. I think we have a duty to try to explain this one of two ways. Either we can explain these things by staying inside the room, or we have to go outside the room for an explanation. If we have to go outside the room for an explanation, we are stuck again with an intruder problem. Only this intruder would span the entire cosmos. And that's why I tried to call this book God's Crime Scene, but my publisher was like, no, you can't use that title. That title sounds like you think that God's committed a crime. I'm just saying that you could actually look at the universe using the same tools we would use in a crime scene to see if the first cause is inside or outside the room. Now we're going to go back to this model. I am not going to spend all night tonight talking about the evidence in all those eight categories. I teach this class at Biola. It takes me 17 hours to go through those eight categories. So we have locked the doors and we're going to hold you in here for 17 straight hours. But no, we're not going to do that. So therefore, God exists. So I've just proved to you that God exists because we're not going to hold you here for 17 hours. But we're going to take this model of comparing evidences to explanations and we're going to move it to the universe and simply ask the question, given these pieces of evidence in the universe, which of these two explanations, either staying inside the room or moving outside of naturalism, is the most reasonable inference from evidence? And we're going to stay in the latter category tonight. We're just going to talk about the last two pieces. Very briefly, we're going to talk about piece number seven, which is that we all recognize that there are objective moral truths in the universe. What I mean by objective moral truths is there are some things that we would say collectively, we all agree, are objectively wrong. They're not a matter of personal opinion. I first started thinking about this when I was working gangs in Los Angeles County. 
That's back when we all had to have mustaches like that. <laughs> that was a prerequisite. I still had hair color back then. Look at that. I was gray over here, but I still had hair color over there. Dang. Anyway, I remember talking to some gangsters who had committed a pretty horrific crime. Uh, a guy named Jesse, his, his sister had uh, a, a local gangster of a rival clique had uh, kind of hit on his sister. And he took such great offense to that that they captured this rival gang member and they just slowly tortured him until finally he died. And when I talked to him about this, he was, felt like this was entirely appropriate. You know, according to his code, he would expect that to be done to him if he had hit on somebody else's sister. So he didn't see that what was wrong with it. And, and as I talked to him, it, he certainly held the personal opinion that this was okay, and his group affirmed him. They also believed it was okay. So I started thinking about, you know, who gets to decide if something is okay? There's kind of a hierarchy, right? A moral hierarchy. And at the bottom are just individuals, people like Jesse, who get to decide things. If all moral truths are simply the result of your thoughts, they're your personal opinions, the problem, of course, would be, is what if you disagree with you? Who gets to adjudicate between these two guys? I could never say that he's right or that he's right. I'd say you're both got to be right and wrong, I guess, because if all moral truth is established by individuals, subjects, well, then I can't, I can't see any subject is wrong because the subject is to say that I get to decide. So I don't think we would, we would camp there. We might say that what his group gets to decide, but then if his rival group says that's not okay to do, and how do I adjudicate between two cliques? Now, the city of L.A. has rules that it forces every gangster to obey. It's kind of an overarching moral code, but not every city operates the same way. And the municipal codes in San Diego are different than the municipal codes in, in L.A. But we have a state of California, of course, which overarches on top of all of that. And you can only do certain things in our county. But, you know, to be honest, it's different in Arizona. That's okay, we have a nation, and the nation kind of has federal laws that attempt to unify and straighten out some of the differences between states. But you know, our country disagrees with other countries on certain laws. That's okay, we have the United Nations, and the United Nations then can kind of try to overarch and mediate uh, problems between nations. My question is, how high does this moral hierarchy go? How do we adjudicate between two nations that disagree? Well, what, how do we get above nations? What, who's, the, who's that judge? If there's a Star Trek world, who adjudicates between the Klingons and the Romulans? That's the problem. For example, we can say there are some things we all agree are never okay to do. No matter who you are, where you are, or when you were in history, it's never been okay to torture babies for the fun of it. As a matter of fact, if you just take that out for the fun of it, and you put that on behind any statement, it's never okay to steal for the fun of it. And you might have a reason you could justify stealing. I stole the code that saved a million lives. They're gonna put that code in the machine, they're gonna blow up a million people, but I stole the code so they couldn't do it. Okay, you could justify it, but stealing for the fun of it, that's not okay to do. And I think this is true not just for him, but it's true all the way up to, who gets to decide this? He actually thought that it was okay to torture a, 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 a rival over what he, that was okay for him. And his group thought it was okay. Oh, I didn't think it was okay. But who gets to decide here? Who in the hierarchy gets to decide whether it's okay or not? That was the question I had. And I think in the end, it's gonna come down to some ultimate group, some ultimate source of moral behavior, an ultimate judge. Now you'll notice that all of these are people groups, and that's important. Every one of these groups we've talked about, whoever it is who gets to decide what is morally true, is, are persons. And that is important to recognize because if you'll notice, I have no moral obligation to my police car. I have no moral obligation to this podium. I can hit it, I can kick it. I don't feel bad about it. I have no moral, object, uh, mor no moral obligation to an object. I have no moral obligation to my flashlight. I only have moral obligations, by the way, I have no moral obligations to physics. If physics are the source of everything we see in the universe, why do we feel moral obligations? You're not morally obligated to physics. 
But you are morally obligated to people groups. I am morally obligated, not to my car, but to the partner sitting next to me in that car. Not to my flashlight, or to anyone's flashlight, but to the person who's holding the flashlight. Moral obligations are always between persons. And if that's true, the question I have is, if there are overarching moral truths that are at this level, and I think there are, because, you know, for example, nations don't agree. So we would say what you guys did, what the Germans did to, to the Jews in, in World War II was not okay. They said it was okay. They even went to the trials in Nuremberg saying you can't prosecute us. In our culture, it, we were told that we would get promoted if we did this kind of thing. So we all said, okay, we're in. I, we were actually uh, venerated for doing this kind of thing. You can't just because you won the war come in here and say that now we're going to get prosecuted for this because your culture doesn't like it. It was okay in our culture. And what did our, our, the judge from our nation say? Well, there's a law above the law. Well, if there is a law above the law, and that's where moral obligations reside, then my question is going to be, who is the transcendent, objective, moral person to whom we are feeling obligated? If it's just physics, why do we have moral obligations? You might have moral truths, but obligations require persons. And Dawkins, I think, kind of describes the way it would be in the universe if there was no moral person and it was just physics. He would say the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And that's what physics are. They are indifferent. They don't care. Physics doesn't care what you do. So if I had to look at this and say, well, do they, does it come from individuals? subjects, even if it came from groups of subjects, I think we have problems. Of course, we could just deny these exist at all, and some people do that. There are other ways to explain moral grounding, and if you want to talk about it in the Q&A, we'll talk about it there, okay? But for me, these are at least three ways that we could get moral truths by staying inside the room of the universe, but these don't work. They don't work because we can't adjudicate between persons. Every moral action would have to be equal. We can't adjudicate between groups. Every group would have to be equally virtuous. And by the way, if you think that groups determine moral truth, then we better get ready to do whatever China tells us to do because they are the largest group. And it would simply be whatever majority of subjects says is true, under that theory, it would have to be true. And anything held by the smaller group would, by its very definition, be immoral. Of course, if there are no moral truths, we have to kind of deny our own experience of the world. We believe there are. Now, on the other hand, if moral truths are grounded in the nature of a moral being that transcends the universe, this would explain why we find and feel obligations, moral obligations, inside the room. But we would have to go outside the room for this kind of being. Jerry Fodor puts it this way, science is about facts, not norms. It might tell us how we are, but it couldn't tell us what is wrong with how we are. There couldn't be a science of the human condition. If, on the other hand, there is a personal source of moral truth and obligation outside the room, that might explain why we sense moral obligations inside the room. Let me just go one more step with you, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, because I, this last one here is where I get a lot of questions. Okay, so tell me how it is, then, that if there's an all-loving God, he would allow the world to be the way it is. I get this question a lot from families. It usually comes in the form of, why would this happen to my loved one? Why would a good God allow this? I had a case years ago. It was my dad's case first. This is my dad over here. My dad worked in this industry also. So we have three Jim Wallaces who work in law enforcement. He started in 1961. I was born in his academy. I took over in 1988. My son was born in my academy. He is now working there now. So we have three Jim Wallaces at our agency. Sometimes people will call and uh, somebody will answer, oh, this is Jim Wallace, and they'll, they'll say, old voice, will go, this is Jim Wallace? Yeah. You're still working there? No, I'm his grandson. He's, he's not working here anymore because that's how long we've been using this name. And this is a case from 1972. It happened on a holiday. This young man uh, was accused of killing a 10-year-old girl in our city. He confessed to the case, about a thousand page transcript, it's pretty horrific. As it turns out, he was not our killer. He confessed to it, but he never matched the evidence, really. And we eventually eliminated him about two years later. 
So this is still an open case. We just solved it about a month and a half ago using Ancestry DNA, which is awesome, right? So I want to thank all of you who are stupid enough to get your ancestry done, <laughs> because now we're taking all of your loved ones to jail. It's awesome. <laughs> but the question their family had is, and I will call this young girl Jackie for the sake of this, because we haven't published the case yet, but why would an all-loving, all-powerful God allow this to happen to my daughter? We, she, she was attacked brutally. She was eventually killed, and she was discarded one coast north of us on the California coastline in Oxnard. And the family would ask this question, you know, why would this happen? Okay, you want me to answer this question? Why would this happen to your daughter? Well, there's a couple of ways I've got to answer it. You know, it's, first of all, I have to think about it as a crime. Why would this crime occur to Jackie? Well, it's never as simple as you might think. And the act of solving cases is about answering that question. Why did this happen to Jackie and who did it, right? But there are many factors involved. I will tell you this. If Jackie isn't the kind of girl who would get into a stranger's car without questioning, she doesn't die that day. But she was the kind of girl who would get into a stranger's car. So that is one piece of the puzzle that I have to consider. Otherwise, I'd be looking for somebody who knew her. But no, it turns out, I don't have to look for someone who knew her because she would get into a stranger's car. That opens up my, my suspect pool huge, right? Also, it happened on a holiday. If it hadn't happened on a holiday, if it hadn't been a holiday where her parents were like, hey, I need your kids to get out and play in the front yard, play in the front street, do not come in here for two hours, we're making dinner. If, if this isn't a holiday and she isn't the kind of kid who gets into a car, it doesn't happen. And I've worked these kinds of cases before. Usually, if you work cases involving pedophiles, you'll find that those folks have had a disturbing upbringing of their own. If he doesn't have that kind of disturbing upbringing, this isn't a holiday and she doesn't get into his car, this doesn't happen. And it was in a very unusual, niche part of our city, a weird kind of a corner of our city that is not on a major thoroughfare. I don't know how anyone would know how to get into that corner of our city and how to get out. It's somebody who knew how to do that, was at least familiar with that area. If he doesn't know how to do that, doesn't have that kind of upbringing, and she isn't the kind of person who gets into that car on a holiday, this doesn't happen. These four conditions had to be met before this happens. You see how we're puzzling this? Not only that, he has to have the kind of car in which he could commit this crime in privacy. He did happen to have that kind of car. And he has to have the window of opportunity in order to... Look, if these things don't happen, if, if these six ingredients are not in place, she doesn't die that day. But these just happen to be in place. So if you're asking me, well, why did this happen to her from a criminal perspective? You know, from a criminal perspective, I would say, well... I have to consider these six elements. I don't know exactly what the relationship is between these six elements, which are primary, which are secondary, which are tertiary. I don't know. i got to figure that out. And then that's going to explain any particular act of evil, including what happened to Jackie. Does that make sense? This is how we work criminal cases. We try to puzzle back, given what we do know. Now, I showed you a diagram earlier around the box about the evidence that I actually do think points to God as the best explanation. And I think that these seven things typically people will use when they talk about whether or not God exists. But there's an eighth thing we're going to talk about now, and that is evil. These first seven things, if they do point to God as a causal suspect, we would call these inculpating pieces of evidence. That's the name for that. But we have to consider evil an additional thing. The question is, is this thing something that points away from God. In other words, I could have good reasons to believe you're the suspect, but then if I find out you've got an alibi and you were out of the state on the day of the murder, well, I don't care how good my other seven things are, he's got an alibi. So that is called exculpating evidence. Is that what evil is? Is evil the thing that eliminates God as a candidate for these other seven things? That's what we're going to talk about before we go to Q&A. Epicurus put it this way famously, and I don't even know that Epicurus actually said this, but it's always attributed to him, so I'll go ahead and go along with the joke, okay? But I think he probably is the person who first said this. And he said it like this, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Well, then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Well, then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Well, then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? What I think he's saying here in English is, if God is all-powerful, 
Well, then couldn't he stop this? If he can't stop it, he's not all powerful. If he doesn't care to stop it, you can't call him all loving. So if he supposedly is all powerful and does care, why wouldn't he stop it? Well, I think it comes down to the same way we put together the case for Jackie. In the first diagram, I tried to show you how we might address it from a criminal perspective. How do we solve what happened to Jackie? But now I'm being asked something different. How could God allow this to happen to Jackie? That's a different question. But I think we answer it the same way on the grounds of several factors we have to consider, like the role of eternity or the importance of free agency or our definition of what love is or just the fact that we have to know what role this plays in character development and calling in terms of also uh, simply that the st we do stupid things sometimes, we get judged for doing stupid things, and finally, do we have enough information to even know the answer to begin with? Now, I actually think that these seven things are the seven pieces of the puzzle, just like the six pieces I showed you for solving the crime related to Jackie. These are seven pieces of the puzzle that have to be used to solve the second question is, why did this happen to Jackie? This is how I explain any act of evil. It's always going to be a cumulative case in which several factors are going to be considered. For example, we have to talk about eternity here, because I think eternity changes everything. When I start thinking about how, why would an all-loving God allow this to happen? Here's what I mean by that. As an atheist, for 35 years, I believed that all of life was simply a line segment from birth, right, to death. Birth to death. Two dots. One on each side. And I wanted 90 pain-free years. My dad would always say, my dad's a very committed atheist. He would always say, yeah, my goal is to live 90 um, 90 years pain-free, you know, great 90 years. And how he, he always say, how he used to say, you say, um, live 90 years and then die at the hands of a jealous boyfriend. <laughs> That's what my dad would say. Think about it. You'll come, then just give it a few minutes, it'll sink in later. So I, would, I wanted 90 pain-free because I have longevity in my family. I thought, hey, I want to die peacefully in my sleep at the age of 90 after I played a round of golf. But if I was to get to 40 and then get cancer and suffer for 10 years and drop dead at 50, I'm going to be PO'd, right? Because I'm thinking I wanted 90, number one, and now I got to suffer for 10 and I get, all this is lost? This is evil because I don't I'm not get to experience any of this. It turns out evil is measured in the context of our lives. That's how we decided this is evil. By the way, if I had lived to 89 and uh, 11 months and then I got an illness and died a month later, not so bad. But this is measured in terms of what is lost. That's why we call it evil, right? But what if I'm wrong about my foundational de uh, definition of what life is? What if life is not a line segment at all? What if life instead was a ray that starts at one point and then extends through the thing we call death and it goes off in this direction forever, infinitely? You guys know your geometry, that's a ray, right? What if life is a ray and not a line segment? That would change things. There are some of you in this room right now who could tell me that when you were born, you had some really bad um, defect that needed to be operated on. And so you had a surgery. And if I had stopped you in that first month when you were being cut and open and all the pain you went through, and I said, hey, how's life going for you? You would say, it stinks. This is a terrible, and why would I even be here given all the pain I've experienced? But by the time you were like three, you forgot about it. You don't even remember it. It's so far in your rearview mirror, it doesn't even matter anymore. This is evil, but by the time you live this life, that's such a big deal. I mean, pain, no one wants to suffer through pain, but you got through it and then you lived a long life. Now, if this view of life I'm describing now as a ray is true, now just go with me, I don't think you have to believe it's true, but if it were true, if life was a ray instead of a line segment, that's what Christianity, that's what most theistic worldviews will offer, if life is a ray instead of a segment, well, then we have to reconsider everything. I don't care how much pain you suffer in your life here, if it's 90 years, every year you're in eternity, this seems smaller and smaller and smaller by comparison. So you're a thousand years into eternity. I don't care how bad your first 90 were. It's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> this is evil. It could all be evil, but it's measured in the context of this if this is the way life really is. And that's why I do think that the idea, the notion of eternity, 
changes the way we see the problem of evil. Because we can't, we can't always say to ourselves, wow, I can't believe she's already dead. Well, if this is true, she's not dead. Also, we have to kind of think about the role of free agency. And a lot of people talk about it. I talk about it maybe a little bit differently, but I think this is an important thing for us to talk about. Look, if, if we're looking at two kinds of possible worlds, a world in which love is possible or a world in which love is impossible, which of these two versions do you think God would create if God is loving? Because the claim is that God's all loving. I think he's going to create a world in which love is possible because why would you call him a loving God if he creates a world where nobody could love? Now, my wife and I have been together for about 40 years, and we got married on Valentine's Day. So let's say I, I split up with her a couple of years ago on Valentine's Day, and I decide to try to win her back, and Valentine's Day comes around next year. And so on February 13th, I buy a card, and I put it in the mail, and I send it to her in an effort to win her back. This is the card I would send her, right? This makes sense. You will love me. Roses are red, bullets are lead. Take me back now or get shot in the head. I think that's a beautiful card. I don't think it'll work because I can, I can force, I can put a gun to her head and ask her, do you love me? She's going to say what? Yeah, I love you. But it wouldn't be true love. Any, any way to compel her to say something that she doesn't freely believe on her own, it would not be genuine. So it turns out if you want this crazy thing called love in the world, by logical necessity, you have to first put something dangerous in place. You have to put something called free agency in place. But that means people have to have the freedom to hate. They may not love, but you will not get love if you don't give people the freedom to hate. It would be a logically inconsistent world. And if there is a God, he has a power to eliminate logical inconsistencies. So in these two kinds of worlds, this is the problem. This world in which love is possible is a very dangerous place to live. Yes, love is possible, but all kinds of bad things happen under free agency. Now look, a loving God would not throw the knife at you and not tell you how to catch it by the handle of the blade. That would be crazy. So a loving God would give you this dangerous foundational tool called free agency, and then he would give you a book that would explain how to not misuse the dangerous thing. That's different. Now, if, if you don't want to read the book or you want to disregard the book, well, then don't be surprised when you misuse the tool. But that's not because God doesn't love us. He's given us both the dangerous tool and the instruction guide. Now, think about this for a second. We've been talking about love and all loving God, but what do we even mean when we say that? What definition of love are we using? I think we sometimes get caught into the kind of cultural definitions of love, right? These are the words that we typically associate with love. But if you're a parent in this room, you know I left off one, right? You all know I left that one off. That word is called tough love. That's got to be on that wall. And I think parents get this. So I have four kids. I have a son, Jim, who is uh, a, a, in, a, he's now a training officer at our agency. I have a son, David, who's an anesthesiologist. I can barely say the word, let alone understand what he's doing. And then I've got uh, two daughters that are 23 and 21. Now, my daughter, Annie, when she first moved away to go to college, she decided that she was going to drop out of school. And I said to her, OK, I get it. School's not for everyone. But if you drop out of school, that means you will be untethered, right? Because I would, be, I would not be doing you a service as a parent to falsely prop you up when, in fact, you can't support yourself. So you've got to figure out, can you do this on your own? And for two years, she did it on her own. She was amazing. But she called us earlier this year and said, I'm going to go back to school. And she's now checked back into school. Now, during that time, when she was out of school, like her car would break down. And, and she would never call and ask, OK? That's not who she is. But she, I'd, I'd hear about it. And I would like, oh, man, I should just send her the money to fix the car. But I didn't. Because I could be done every month. I could find some reason to send her money. And I knew that that was not going to serve her well long term. I had to do this lousy thing on the bottom that nobody wants to do. Yeah, I don't want to do that. And I think sometimes we think that God is just here to, to kind of check our demand list off like Santa Claus. But that's not what God is. 
if he is a parent, yeah, he might be involved in all these things, of course, but he'd also be involved in that thing. And so when that happens, we're like, where the heck is God? Well, he might be just doing that. C.S. Lewis is a really an apologist ahead of his time, but I want to just read you what he says about this. I think he gets it perfectly. He says, we want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. You know, a senile benevolence who, they say, like to see young people enjoying themselves, and whose plan for the universe was that simply, it might be truly said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. That's what grandparents do. That's not what parents do. I, tell her I can't wait to be a grandfather so I can mess up my kids' you know, lives, right? I'm going to spoil those kids like crazy. But that's what grandfathers do, not what fathers do. And fathers are the ones who say, no, I can't send that. Look, if, if this is go back to our timeline for a second. So, so you have this part of your life right here, which is your temporal life, right? And this is kind of your eternal life. You might say this is your life here on earth, and this is your life after earth, okay? Now, you've got parents, and your parents are the ones who steward you over this part of your life, right? And so a parent over here might allow something bad to happen to you over here because they're trying to achieve something good over here. That's what I was doing with Annie. But if, if, if theism is true, if God exists, he would be over the entire timeline, all of it. And you might say, well, yeah, but you know, I've seen, look, I've known people who had bad things happen to them and nothing good ever came of it. Well, yeah, stupid. He to, he's not just dealing with this part of your life. He has the entire timeline. He, he might be trying to achieve something over there. You just don't know. You're not going to see it in this life. He's got domain over all of it. And you know that if you really love someone, you don't give a lick about their comfort. You care about their character. And when you love someone, you aim at the things that last, the things that are long. Now, this is the next explanation I will tell you. This is a factor we have to consider, but I used to think it was one of the worst explanations ever for the problem of evil. This idea that somehow God would use evil in our lives to develop our character, really? Like he couldn't find an easier way to do this? But even as an atheist, there were some things that I would have said I wanted to see in my world. These things I wanted to see in my world. These were virtues that even as an atheist, I said were my high virtues. I want to live in a world. My dad right now will tell you that he also wants to live in a world that has these characteristics. But if God wanted to get these characteristics, are you sure you want that really? Because you know these things don't just come when you snap your fingers. Each of these moral virtues is achieved in response to a hardship. You don't just snap your fingers and get courage. You get courage once you've had to face danger. You want compassion? Really? Well, that means you're going to have to face some suffering. You, you want forgiveness? Well, then what evil are you going to forgive? You want self-sacrifice? Well, that means you're going to have to have some kind of hardship. And you're going to have some kind of poverty if you want charity. In other words, if you wanted all those high virtues, you would have to design a world that looks like this. And oh, that's exactly what we have. That's how you get the virtues we all say are so virtuous. You create, this is why I never pray for patience. Who does that? <laughs> Think about it. That's a stupid thing to pray for. Because what is God going to do then? He's going to bring you something that you have to be patient about. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> Lewis puts it this way. To ask that God's love should be content with us as we are is to ask that God should cease to be God. Because he is what he is, his love must, in the nature of things, be impeded and repelled by certain stains in our present character. And because he already loves us, he must labor to make us lovable. There are times when I think, you are probably some stories in this room in which people have become Christians or have become believers or have come to God because they've had an experience that basically shook them to their core and they realized that their priorities were messed up and they actually became believers as a result. Now, that's, that's tough. I get it. But I think there are times when God can use evil to get our attention. And I used to think, hey, really? God can just do it easy, right? He's got people he wants to reach. He could just gently reach out and rope them in, right? Could do that for me. Well, he was trying to do that with me, I think. He wrote me a letter I never read. 
refused to open it. Didn't even own one until I was 35. My, my, I think my mom had one. I know my dad had one. He's an atheist. Didn't want to read it. I was working on a surveillance team at the time. I was in a car 10 hours a day following guys around who were doing bank robberies. It was a great job. But I had a hard time finding things to listen to because in that time in Los Angeles, it seemed like every third radio station was a Christian radio station. It was hard to avoid all that stuff, but I managed to avoid it. And I even had people in my life that would have tried to share. I managed to avoid them too. Well, if you don't want to come this way, the way that a lot of people come to faith, well, he can do it another way. He can either draw you or he could push you. But if he's going to push you, he's probably going to do it through some kind of suffering through something that'll grab you. So when you're finally at the bottom, you've got no place to look but up. Lewis puts it this way, let me implore the reader to try to believe, if only for the moment, that God, who made these deserving people, may really be right when he thinks that their modest prosperity and the happiness of their children are not enough to make them blessed, that all this must fall from them in the end. There are times when we, the most self-sufficient people I know are the people who are least interested in God. So sometimes God will work to make you less self-sufficient. I think also we've got to think about sometimes justice just demands a certain response. Look, we all want this God that is loving, but remember that love is directly connected to justice. You cannot have love without justice. So if I told my son David, oh, we're driving down the street, and I say, oh, David, I just want you to know I love you to death. I think you're a great man. I'm so proud of you. But then at the next corner, I see a guy robbing a liquor store run across the street in front of us, and I say, stop, Mr. Robert. I just want you to know I love you to death. I respect the hell. If I just say the same thing to him I just said to my son David, well, then David's going to think, really? That meant nothing what you said to me, because you'll say that to anybody. If you will not justly dispense your mercy, it's just a platitude. There are people you will say, I love you to, and people you will not say that to, which makes, when you do say it, it means something. Love without justice is just a, a, a word. Justice without love, though, is tyranny. So you have to have both of these things, this, this terrible balance of justice and mercy. They are perfectly represented in the nature of God, but we always get it wrong. But just remember, a loving God is a just God, and there are three forms of justice in our country, and I think all parents understand this. One form of justice simply looks in the rearview mirror. It's like when you're mad about something your kid did yesterday. It's like, I just want to slap the dog snot out of that kid because yesterday he did this, and I'm just mad about yesterday. And I get it, you know, you want, basically you want some kind of retribution, right? <laughs> I want to punish this kid for what he did in the past. But most of us, if we're parents, we try not to do that. I think most of the time we punish as parents, we're doing something that looks forward, not backwards. This is called utilitarian justice. In other words, I'm going to say this to my son or my daughter, usually it's my daughter Mia. I'll say, Mia, look, I, I, I'm not punishing you. I'm not mad about yesterday. No, I'm not mad about yesterday. But I know if you continue to do that, you're going to train wreck your entire life. So because I'm concerned about tomorrow and I'm concerned about your future, I am now going to put some, you know, some consequence to what you did yesterday. It's forward-looking. But there will be a consequence. Now, she might not like that. She might think that doesn't seem fair. But it's because I'm concerned about her forward movement. And there are just times when you have to pay back for things you've done wrong. This is the three systems of justice that are in our judicial system. And I think all parents get this, and all parents do this. And if God is our parent, he will do it too. Finally, I think we have to be honest about how little we know and how this weighs into the equation. Let me go back to the uh, actual complaint offered by Epicurus. So here it is. He said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. The first part of this really is talking about, is he willing but not able? That's, that's about whether or not he's powerful enough. The second part is about whether or not he's loving enough. Make sense? This is why it feels like a dilemma. But what Epicurus did was he left out, this is not, by the way, the definition of God as we know it, as a Christian, for example. It's not that definition. It's part of the definition, but it's not all of it. It turns out that the thing that Epicurus left off is the thing that solves the dilemma, which is why I think he left it off. It's not just that God is all-powerful, he is, and he's all-loving, he is. It's that he's also all-knowing. And because he knows the future now, he might allow certain things to happen because he knows the consequence if he does or doesn't do something. 
So here's our timeline again. This is the stuff that we know about, but this is the stuff that God knows about. Let's put it this way. A, a French Dominican priest once said it, that he wished he could, here's what he said. He said, if God could concede me his omnipotence for 24 hours, you would see how many changes I would make in the world. But if he gave me his wisdom too, I think I would leave things just as they are. Because we don't know what butterfly effect anything happening today might have 200 years from now or 1,000 years from now. Well, really, a life could be lost because you're trying to, yeah, because remember, life is not a line segment. The life isn't really lost. It's just it's managing what's going to happen at any point in your life, remembering that everything that you do in your life is connected to someone else's life. We've all seen enough science fiction to know that's true, right? So again, we go back to this. Look, these are the things that I would have to assess to figure out why, any God, uh, why God would allow any act of evil. Kind of the same way I build cases. Of course, the, re the problem here is I don't know which of these is a priority to God in any particular act of evil. So I can't, I'm not in God's mind to know what he's prioritizing here. But I know the seven things that God would have to prioritize are those seven things. The question is, well, I don't even know what relationships there are between these seven things. It's a more complicated mess. But in the end, this is how we explain an act of evil. But let me ask you, though, before we close, why are we calling this evil to begin with? Because you don't like it? You don't like what happened to Jackie? If that's all it is, if it's just a matter of whether you like it or not, if all evil is simply comes from what you think in your, ma in your mind, well, then you could eliminate all evil tomorrow by simply changing your opinion. But that won't work because you're not the standard. It's not even what the group thinks is evil because there are some groups who wouldn't think that's evil. It turns out if you want to call this evil, you need a standard above you and above your group that determines what is not evil, what is righteous. This is what C.S. Lewis realized when he was, uh, was an atheist. He said it this way, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But what had I got, where had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? Unless you have a standard of perfection by which you are judging something, how do you call it? It's just your own personal opinion then. Look, the idea here is we're in the room and we have some stuff in the room we have to explain. Now, I think God is the best explanation for everything in the room, but some people might say, well, no, evil eliminates God, it exculpates God, because you can't have an all-loving God who's all-powerful. He would never allow evil to occur. But the problem is, how are you defining evil? It turns out in order to define evil the way that you mean, true evil, objective transcendent evil, would require an objective transcendent standard. You couldn't have that kind of evil unless there is a God in the room. So it's yet another piece of evidence that points outside the room to a standard of righteousness. When it's violated, we call that evil. Lewis put it this way, of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too, for the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust. Not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. If there is a standard of righteousness outside the room that transcends all of us, then we would see that any violation. You cannot have the shadows without the sunlight. If there's sunlight, then that would explain why we see shadows. So we started with this room and asked the question, do we play this game? We turned it toward the universe. So before I became a police officer, I was actually an illustrator. I, was, I got a bachelor's degree in design and a master's degree in architecture torture from UCLA. And uh, so I get to draw my own illustrations in all my own books. So these are some of the illustrations out of the book. But I think that the best explanation for these things is actually outside the room. Now, I want to say to you, though, that I've learned a long time ago that at any crime scene that I enter, I can tell you something about my suspect before I ever meet him or her, that's usually a him. But my point is I can tell you something about the suspect because the evidence in the room will at least begin to develop for me a suspect profile. Because I've got to find somebody who can explain all of the evidence in this crime scene. I've got eight pieces of evidence in the universe. I'm looking for a common causal suspect. 
It's not going to be Mick Jagger. Do you guys even know who Mick Jagger is? <laughs> He's been arrested probably as much as anybody I know, but it's not him. Why? Because he can't explain those eight pieces of evidence in the crime scene. They have certain characteristics that must be in place to explain these eight things. I'm looking for the spaceless, timeless, immaterial first cause that has fine-tuned the universe for the purpose of life to emerge in the universe, that is the source of all information, because it's intelligent, that we find in the genome, is also the designer behind the appearance of design we see in biology, who has created in its own image another set of minds that have free agency, and is the, the standard for moral good by which we would even judge anything good or bad or evil. That's not Mick Jagger. <laughs> but that is classically what we think of when we think of God. And I could get to this point without ever, ever opening any holy book. I didn't trust holy books. I will tell you, I had a case a few years ago. I think I've been on Dateline more than anywhere in the country, but this case was from 1979. This man was 27 years old when he killed my victim. He was 63 when I took him to jail. Now, the evidence in this was robust, and it was on several different lines. We had some eyewitness testimony. We had some uh, behaviors that he exhibited back when he was a young man after the murder and before the murder. We had some physical property that he left at the crime scene. And we even had some witness statements, I mean, some uh, statements of his that we were able to analyze and we could see that he was lying. He had some deception indicators in his statements. That's called forensic statement analysis. I will tell you that these four kinds of evidence are very different. This is witness evidence, well, a different set of experts we brought into trial to testify about witnesses. This is all behavioral evidence. Another set of, of experts will come in to talk about that. On the other side, we have some forensic material evidence. We'll have different people from the crime lab come in from that. And finally, we have some forensic statement analysis that will bring in somebody for that. When you have four different categories of evidence that all point to the same person, you've got a pretty good inference. Here we have eight pieces of evidence, and they are in four broad categories. Two are cosmological, two are biological, two are mental, and two are moral. They are completely different experts in every field, from astrophysicists to biochemists to, neurologi to a, a neuroscientist, rather, and, and to just philosophers. If all of them point to the same causal suspect, you probably have a decent inference. Now, I will tell you that in defense uh, cases, what will typically happen is a defense team will come in and say, oh, no, Jim, I can explain this different ways. I don't need to use this as an explanation. I can look at those eight pieces of evidence, and I could offer three or four ways to explain this, and three or four ways to explain this, and this, and this, and this. And they do that in criminal trials all the time. The problem is that none of these experts think the other one is right. This guy says, this guy's an idiot. This guy says, no, he's wrong. And none of these explanations over here can be used to explain this thing over here. These are entirely different sets of causes. And nobody agrees. There's another way to explain those same pieces of evidence, though. I can offer one common causal factor that not only unifies all the evidence, it explains all of it. So the question is, which of these two is a better explanation? We've been looking for a theory of everything for years, a way to kind of unify quantum physics with traditional classic physics. I think there is a theory of everything. It's called God, because it explains everything in the universe and unifies the evidence set. Now, I did bring books tonight, so I'll make one shameless plug for books. But to be honest, I just bought them on my own cost and shipped them here rather than have the publisher do that. So we can give them to you for 10, for 10 bucks. So we'll, we'll do that. But I've written three books that kind of make the case for Christianity. We did not talk about that tonight. As a matter of fact, the case we made tonight, you can make if you were a Muslim. There's nothing about tonight's case that is specifically Christian. But we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want to. And so I've finally written a book that really makes a case for why we should make the case, because believe it or not, most Christians do not think any of this matters anyway. Because when you ask Christians, why are you a Christian, most Christians will tell you, because I was raised this way. That is the absolute most popular answer amongst Christians. They don't even know if there's any evidence to support it. Second most popular answer is, 
I've had an experience that demonstrated for me it was true. Some kind of an experience, I'll offer something. And by the way, those are the same two most popular answers for Muslims, the same two most popular answers for Mormons, and for Buddhists, and for everybody. Doesn't make it right or true. So I had to make a, write a book that kind of makes a case for making the case. And of course, I've got kids' books too, which seem to be more popular at, um, at uh, universities for some reason. But each book, I brought the adult, I brought the adult books tonight and they're for $10. But let me just tell you this. When I was an atheist, I suspected that most Christians were only here to sell me something. I am not here to sell you something. So I've got a website where everything is available for free and downloadable as a PDF file. And I write three articles a, a week all the videos, everything you can take home with you. You just download it and keep it, and it's all free. So you don't need that book. I'm happy to sign a book if you want to get one, but I'm not here to sell you a book. Also, we've got a phone app where everything that's on the website is available on the phone app, and if you want to reach out to me, do it through social media, because I think I'm on all the platforms. That being said, we are now about to move into questions, and you can ask a question about anything, and I'll be happy to try to answer it. Oh, he's, he just, he's, gonna, he's got his camera set over there. He does. He just, he'll, tell you where to, he'll tell you where to put it. You tell him. Right. Right. Thank right. you. Okay, cool. Sorry. It's all right. Hey, we are very highly technical tonight. We have got all the cameras in place. We're live streaming tonight. So, yes, your question will be uh, televised to the entire world. You know, they always say there are no stupid questions. Oh, yes, there are. <laughs> So don't ask a stupid question. Okay, but get in line over here at this microphone and ask any question you want. I know the first question is always the most difficult, so we'll skip it and go to the second question. So get up there. And I'll, by the way, I have some rules for questions. Here they are, basically. Ask any question you want. I'll try to answer the question. And if you have a follow-up, if there's somebody standing behind you, just step to the back and ask the follow-up after everyone's had a chance to ask their first question. All right, that being said, get up there and ask a question. Oh, the best question gets a free book, and you're paying for it. Okay. Oh, now see, that's it worked. Here, our first, our first victim is coming up right now. Hi, how's it going? What's your name? My name's Proshwal. Proshwal. Mm -hmm. Good to meet you, Proshwal. Nice to meet you, sir. Um, okay, so, so you mentioned that there's kind of a unifying explanation for like all the various causes that would be God. And, mm -hmm. I, and I believe that amongst the various causes that you mentioned, you've probably considered evolution in there as yes. well. Uh, in, in my mind, not just the concept of evolution, but the concept of everything interacting like as particles with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and even you mentioned free will, that like maybe free will doesn't exist. Maybe everything we've, we're doing right now is a consequence of a, of a, you know, a series of motions set in, uh, action before but I think that if you're considering the simplest explanation mm -hmm. as your criteria then maybe you know to explain the existence of a god might be even more complicated like how a god itself came into meaning might be more complicated itself than than that particulate theory so in that case I would believe that you know something that like science based would almost seem like a more logical explanation than God. Okay, I think I understand. Let me see if I understand your question. There's a couple of things, uh, two questions I, I kind of hear in the gist of this. Number one, this idea of a simplest explanation. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not my claim. I'm looking for the most thorough and complete information, uh, the best inference from evidence. Okay. Because I have to define what you mean by simple otherwise. Man, you know, what, man. Do mean, what do I mean by simple? So, mm -hmm. so that's the first thing. Yeah. But I think the bigger question is, is then we have to ask ourselves, well, then how did this thing that we're using as our unifying cause, God, come into existence? That seems to be one of the things you're, you're asking. Okay, right. so let me just answer that first, and then you can hop in behind if you want to ask a follow-up, okay? So how I look at this is I, I think, okay, if the question is, well, do I have to have an explanation for God? Two things about that I think are, are problematic. Number one, the classic definition of God is the uncreated creator. So if we're asking who created the uncreated creator, well, that, in his definition, he's the uncreated creator. So the question doesn't really make great sense, but I, that to me was not as satisfying as this. Even as an atheist, we believe, I believe, there was something that was uncreated that it was a cause. I would have said at the time that it was probably some kind of multiverse generator, some, some environment in which universes pop into existence, 
But that, that as Belenkin says, as Alexander Belenkin says, that thing itself can't be caused, because then we're looking for the cause of that cause. Right. So we all believe, whether we're atheists or theists, in a first uncaused cause. We all believe in that. The only question is, is that first uncaused cause personal or impersonal? Is it a personal, all-powerful being, or is it an impersonal set of forces that might be like this, this multiverse generator, for example, that is somehow creating all these sets of universes, including our own? So I think when I'm looking at that, well, the problem I have is that the impersonal first cause is more problematic when I'm trying to explain information in DNA. It's more problematic when I'm trying to explain mind. It's more problematic when I'm trying to explain moral obligations that are always not between impersonal forces, but between persons. So there's a couple of reasons why I think if I just had to um, default between these two choices, I would probably be like Anthony Flew, where I'm thinking, no, I think that information is best explained by mind and intelligence, and that um, moral obligations are best explained by persons. So that's why I think of those two choices I would probably get. But all of us, just keep in mind, all of us believe that there is some kind of uncaused first cause. That question is already off the table. It's just a matter of whether it's personal or impersonal. I'll come back to you, though, if you want to ask another one. Go ahead. What's your name, sir? Uh, Michael. Michael. Good to talk to you, Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is You uh, can't use your phone because I'm, I'm outnumbered. <laughs> okay, i got to get a phone. I'm going to use my laptop then. Go ahead. Go ahead. Connected to my hive mind oh, okay, here. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this question is, uh, I guess, like, I, I used to be an atheist. Now I'm a Christian. But, you know, this question is a question that, you know, I learned while I was an atheist that I still haven't really been able to find a satisfying okay. response to. I mean, I give you one either, so we'll see. Yeah. Um, so it, the question is, how would you respond to someone who said that God allowing a rape to happen is unjust? Uh, because a rape indicates the violation of someone's free will to decline sex. And okay. if someone says that God allows this injustice to happen so that the world can have free will, mm -hmm. is saying that he's respecting the rapist's right to free will, but not the victim's. Uh, because it would be allowing humans to have the free will to violate other people's free will. Right. You know, our, our world is a world in which we have the free will to violate other people's free that's will. Right. That's, what, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, like Without how do you that, I would not have a job. So I'm actually grateful that we have that kind of free will. I hate to say it. But think yeah. about it. It's not that God loves the rapist, that he loves him so much that he allows him that free will to do that terrible thing. It's that God loves the victim enough to allow him or her the freedom to love at all. Because I could eliminate that kind of thing. What is the movie with um, Christian Bale's? Uh, it's like a Matrix kind of movie. It's about maybe 10 years old now. Equilibrium. Equilibrium. Thank you. <laughs> I can never remember the name of that movie. Anyway, um, it's a great movie because in that movie, uh, they've eliminated all free will, basically all passions of any kind. And everyone has to take an injection every day. And his job as a police officer is to make sure that everyone takes their injection. Hmm. And there's no crime. No crime anywhere, but the one day he, he either inadvertently or intentionally skips his, his dose, and he suddenly has feelings of romance towards somebody, and he decides to keep skipping his dose. But the whole tension of that movie is that in order to have the things we so value, even, you know, it's not just love that is, requires free agency. Without free agency, you cannot have rationality. You can't reason freely between two concepts if you don't have free agency. God loves you enough to allow you to reason. Mm. He also loves you enough to allow you to love, to allow you to um, be creative. You can't even have art without free agency. You can't have any creativity without free agency. You can't have culpability without free agency. How can I hold you culpable if you have no control over what you do? So it turns out that yes, there will, there will, there will there be casualties? In this dangerous world, yes, there will be casualties. I know that sounds brutal. That's just the, the cop of me who's speaking. But there will be casualties. But that's why this idea of eternity changes everything. Hmm. Because it's, it's not going to be measured. Her, her, the victim's life is not measured in that moment. It's measured across eternity. And so that, that's, why I would, that's my only response to that. But I think that it's not that he loves the, 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 the criminal so much. 
he, he loves the victim. And, which, and what, well, all of us get the benefit of free agency. But it does mean it's a dangerous world in which we live. And we have to make sure that we try to protect ourselves from people who would hurt us. Hmm. That's Thank really you. all I could probably say to that. Yeah. Sorry. Wasn't very satisfied, I'm sure. But <laughs> next question. What's your name, sir? Hello, sir. My name is Steven. Thank you so much for coming to Ohio State, EMS Wallace. Thank you, Steven. I'm glad to be here. And similar to Michael's question, I actually had a question uh, revolving some of the critiques against uh, the problem and, and of evil and theodicy. One of them kind of revolves around this uh, theological quagmire when a lot of these objections have to do with God's preemptive will and foreknowledge. Yes. And one of the seven factors that you provided in explaining um, why evil exists is the free agency that human beings have. Well, the objections towards this is, well, if God in his foreknowledge has already predetermined what would happen and already knew what all, I guess, possible scenarios would have been, and he already decreed that before the foundations of the world in eternity pass, then how can you say that God justly is essentially the originator or the initiator or instigator of evil at that point? Right. Right. So how do you reconcile... Well, this is like the classical theological question. How do you reconcile yeah. humans' free will with the foreknowledge and preemptive plan of God? Let me put it in a slightly different way. I hear it this way. So let me tell me if you hear it this way, too. I hear, okay, so you're saying that as a theist that under atheism... Yes, yes, that, I'm operating under the right, theistic right, right. perspective. But. So under atheism, there's, we would say, well, there really isn't any free agency, and even atheists will admit this. Some will, like Sam Harris, will yeah. admit that there is no free agency that all of the things you th think you're thinking are actually just neurons that are firing in your brain, and they're firing at the behest of prior neurons that are firing over which you had no control. Because all we have is a set of physical, that's called event causation, not agent causation. And so I would say, well, if that's true, then we don't really have that kind of free agency. That on, the, on the flip side, though, he might say, well, look, you theists believe that God is in complete control and has all that power, and therefore you have no free agency either. Everything has been preordained. God knows the future now. Well, there's a couple of things I would say about that. Number one, that is a, an ageless debate amongst Christians. And there are several camps of Christians who hold different views on this unbelievable relationship between God's sovereignty and our free agency. I'm probably not going to solve that quagmire for you tonight. But I will say this, the fact that God might know the outcome of a game does not mean he's controlling the people in the game. Any more than if I, there's a game on tonight. There's a football game on right now in the NFL. You guys know who it is? It's not Cincinnati, is it? It is Cincinnati. Why is anybody even here? <laughs> so, so look, you know, if you're like me, I don't want to know the end of that game. All right? But, but if, if somebody like, tells me, yells it out right now from the back of the room, I, okay, I can go home now and know how the game ends, but it doesn't mean I'm controlling the actions of the players even though I know how the game ultimately ends. But here's the more important thing. Under these two options, a universe that is created and governed by a divine being, or a universe that is really created and operated under physics, only one has the possibility of free agency, in which an all-powerful God might say, no, 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 that's on them. Physics could never do that. Physics could never decide to let go of the process. But a being, an all-powerful being, could let go of the process. Why? How? That's under theological debate. But the point is, there is no debate on the other side. There is no way to get it on the other side. So of these two options, I'm willing to stand over here where I'm not quite sure how that really works, but I know it doesn't work over there. Yeah, I, um, I, understand. I understand the position. Let me, just, let, me, let me just get, uh, come back and ask me a follow-up. Yeah, sure. Oh, um, yeah, so, yeah, let me come right back to that. I'm sorry. Next up. And get in line there, and we'll, we'll get all these questions done. We're going to be here for a little while, unless you guys want to leave. Go. Hey, I'm David. David, good um, to meet you. My question was, at the beginning, you yes. said that when a crime scene turns into a sense of urgency, yes. it's the fact that an intruder came through. Yes. So my question is, when you recognized that God was the intruder in the crime yes. scene of the universe, where did the urgency come through to you? Okay, so that's, that's why I mentioned that issue of urgency, because I do think that if we know we are talking about an intruder, I did have a sense of urgency. Because if I, if I realize at this point that, that, uh, that my decisions that I'm making in my temporal life do have a consequence on eternity, I was 35. 
and I was, I was working uh, a detail that put me in harm's way about twice a week. The kinds of people who were taken to jail were taken together to jail in progress robbery suspects. So they're in the process of committing a robbery when we would jump out of our cars and stop it. And so I was thinking, you know, I used to call my wife and say, hey, we're getting ready to do this crazy thing. And then she would say, stop calling me. I don't want you to call me. Call me after it's over. But don't call me before. But I wanted to call her so I could at least make sure if I didn't leave the house right or if I didn't say goodbye to her that morning or whatever, I wanted to make sure I talked to her before I would do this crazy thing. So I did have a sense now of urgency about these kinds of decisions because I knew we had an intruder. Yeah, so that's how it kind of played out in my own life. It was kind of like the temporality of, like you realize that right. you don't have a lot of time to make the decision. Make decisions, right? There, there's these things I call trajectory decisions, right? Uh, like for example, a lot of you are in your 20s right now. You're gonna make the most important decisions, believe it or not, you'll ever make in your life right now. I could make a decision and buy the wrong car in my 60s. It's a lame car, it sucks gas, and it's always broken down. No big deal, I just get rid of it, buy a new one. I'm 60, I can afford to do it. I'm 57 now, so I can afford to do that. But when I was 21, if I bought that same car, man, that would have wrecked me, okay? So I can make a bad decision now that I couldn't make then. So for example, if I'm leaving Earth, and I'm going on a rocket ship to the moon, and I make a two degree error, but I'm only a mile out from the moon, I'm still gonna hit the surface of the moon. But if I make that same two degree error just leaving Earth, I will miss the moon by thousands of miles. These are trajectory decisions. It turns out all of you in this room, I'm gonna say something that's kind of off script, but you're about to make some important trajectory decisions. And I bet you think that they really are about education and job. They kind of are. Those are important decisions, but they're not as important as the other trajectory decisions you need to make. The first one I think is simply worldview. What is the true view of the world? That's what we're talking about tonight. The second one, are you ready for this? Crazy. It's spouse. You can make great choices in your job, great choices in your career, make the wrong choice as spouse. Not going to go well. You can make bad choices in your career and your education. If you choose the right spouse, it's going to be okay. Spouse is an important trajectory decision. Uh, I think also mission is an important trajectory. I never saw law enforcement. I wasn't a believer when I became a cop, but I thought the architecture was cool and I had a good time doing it, but it was all about me. It really was. It was all about my creations, my buildings, my efforts. I wanted to have my name you know, created in a building. But it turns out I felt that law enforcement was about calling. It was about something other than me. It put me in last place. I was, I'm willing to lay it all down for a community. I don't even know who these people are. So that, that, that idea of mission and calling is, I think, the third trajectory decision we need to make. So that's why I think, yeah, those early decisions are more important. Thank you. Thanks, brother. All right. Now, what I have to say may prove to be simple. OK. But it helps. You know, everybody, when something happens, the first one to get be blamed is it blamed is God. Why do you want to blame him? Because if you examine the Bible and understand it, sin entered in heaven first, but by Lucifer, the archangel. And, of course, he was kicked out, and unfortunately, he came to earth. It's troubled earth ever since. But if you want to take two words, Respect and responsibility. All the ramifications that come with them, you would clean up not only this, this building, but the world. Because responsibility, your responsibility for everything you do and what you do around you with your neighbor or what have you. And if you clean things up, you don't dump it at the curb. You clean it up all the way. The whole thing is, and with respect, you respect the person next to you. You respect their, their, their ability not maybe to fix their house up the best, but they're trying. So if we have an understanding amongst us, and you put aside all this junk about, well, I'm this, I'm black, I'm white, I'm purple. Put that aside and use the responsibility and respect and all its ramifications and you see how quick everything turns into a factor where love can come about. 
Thank you. All right. Let me just say one thing as we as uh, we're getting to the next question you can come up too. Um, you'll see that when I usually talk about these kinds of, of, of settings, I, I still take the position I took as an atheist. So if you were going to make your case to me, I wasn't interested in what the holy book said. Now I do think that if your holy book is true, it'll be an accurate reflection of your world. So what you find in there will reflect your world. But for me, I think we get to, through natural revelation, a lot that then is confirmed in special revelation. Now, if we're going to talk about the Bible, that's a different talk. But I just wanted to, for tonight, I'm, I've been kind of staying away from what your Bible says about this issue. Go. Hey, I really am fascinated with the question of consciousness and the mind-body yes. problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I like what you've written in God's Crime Scene about that. Um, I read in Anthony Flew's book, yes. he has an appendix with some stuff on consciousness as pointing to the existence of God. And um, I really like Thomas Nagel, even though he eliminates God for emotional reasons. I feel like he has an appreciation for the problem. Can you point me toward other oh, people who deal with that? Yeah, okay, so, so what I tried to do now, you, you have God's crime scene. So you have my appendix in God's crime scene, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so what I had to do for God's crime scene, I wanted to make sure I accurately captured everyone's opinion or everyone's view about how to explain these phenomena from inside the room. So yes, I think that God is the best explanation from outside the room, but it's not like atheists don't offer their own explanations from inside the room, and they do. They offer explanations for how you get consciousness from inside the room. So I had to read 134 of these books so I could kind of accurately capture so I start like quoting, I use a, what do they call that? It's a device you can scan over your books and it puts it right into a Word document. Have you guys seen that? It's called a C pen. Oh yeah, it's awesome. So you put it in your USB port and you just scan the book and it puts it right into a Word document. So I'm scanning through all these books, getting the best quotes from all these people, and I end up with a 98,000 Word um, document. I'm only allowed, I think, like 50,000 words in the whole book. And I've got 98,000 words in quotes. So what I tried to do in the book is that secondary, if you look in the appendix, okay. I still think that is the best list of other resources to describe the other views of mind. And there are a ton, right? Behavioralism, functionalism, there's all kinds of ways of describing this. And they're all in the book, in the appendix. But if you ask me right now, you've mentioned several good ones. Um, I, I'm gonna have a hard time remembering all different people. These are all philosophers, mostly philosophers. That, that, that discipline is still governed more by philosophers than neuroscientists. Right? They are looking at some of the things that neuroscientists have done, but it's still mostly philosophers who are talking about. I'm sorry I don't have it off the top of my head, but that, you have that book that's all yeah. in that. I try to give you three, uh, was it three or five books from inside the room and three or five books from outside the room right. for each of the eight topics. So. What's your name? Um, my name is Missy. Hi, Missy. I You've heard a few, uh, said a few times that um, the physics cannot explain um, things that God can explain. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the physics is our most um, viable route to finding out what mm -hmm. is everything, basically. Okay. Um, I'd say it's probably our best route. So would you ever think that things in physics and religion could ever come full circle and like there will be an explanation? For everything. Yeah, okay. Scientifically. So, got it. Okay, so a couple things to say about that. I do think that science and theology have something to partner. Because I think there's a difference between facts and inferences. There are a difference between facts and inferences. Okay? So I might bring several pieces of evidence into a trial, and you're going to infer a verdict from those pieces of evidence. I think science is, like you said, a great way to develop, to, to get the facts. It turns out that those of us who believe that God is the best inference, we're looking at the exact same set of facts that the people who think he isn't the best inference. We all agree on the facts. We all agree on the biochemistry. We all agree on the physics. We all agree. We just think that that points in one of two directions. I just think it points most reasonably to a person. Now, here's why I say that. If you think about when your teachers would assign a, new, a paper to you in college, right? They asked, I want you to make sure you answer the classic questions. What? When? How? Where? Why? If you ask those five questions, science asks those questions. Science asks those questions quite well. 
If I ask those five questions at a crime scene, I will never take anyone to jail. Because the what, when, how, where, why is not the question that's most important. I gotta ask the who question. The sixth question is a who. Science for centuries asked all six questions, but post-enlightenment, scientists will not allow themselves to ask a who question. What if all the science points to a who? Sorry, out of bounds. Now, what if all the science you developed, the facts we all agree on, is best explained? If you, information, show me wherever in the history of the entire universe information has ever come from anything other than intelligence. You can't get it from physics and chemistry. You can't get it from space, time, and matter. Information is a product of somebody who codes with the intention of this thing being decoded. That's why I call these in codex, right? So if the science says that's information in the genome, this is what Antony Flew, after you know, 80 years of being an atheist, said, yeah, that, that's, that's the problem. Is the science is pointing to a who question we refuse to ask. So I think it can be. Now, if the other question is, well, isn't it possible that science could eventually have an answer? Sure. But I can't, my, my juries are not allowed to ask this question. Well, look, I get it. Everything makes him look really guilty. We think he is guilty. But what if five years from now something happens that change, we could change our mind? No, guys, make, you have everything in front of you now. Make the decision now. We can appeal it later. But now you make the decision on the basis of what we know now. So if we were honest about it, and we said, well, yeah, the, the science might have to wait until then to, to say that the science can explain it. You can't say now that science can explain it, because it can't. The best inference right now is a who. Today, given what we know today, I think the best inference is a who. And given what we know today, it's reasonable to me to decide it's a who. But are we rushed? Okay. Well, if you drop dead tomorrow, and it really is a who, I mean, you make this decision now. Now look. 15 years from now, if this has been changed, you can change your mind. But if you're not willing to even consider now because you think, well, I'm going to wait for 15 years to see if it changes, well, then it's not, you're not being honest. We make decisions now. You don't, you don't buy a car thinking it will be the best price 15 years. You buy the car that's the best price now. We assess things in the, in the moment and make decisions in the moment. You can change your mind later if something changes. It won't, but if you think it's great. But I think if, if the evidence points to this now, we tell our jury, you're not allowed to ask those what if questions. That's called speculating. We don't allow that. You could always find some why you might reasonable doubt, you're beyond imaginary possible doubt. That's not the standard. That's how I would probably answer that question. But I do think that science is our best path to get the facts, but science will never give you an inference. Inferences are the things that free thinking agents do with the facts. So I, there's no fact of evolution. Evolution may be true, but I would not call it a fact. It's an inference from facts. It could be a correct inference. I'm not going to argue tonight. You can take that home and think about it yourself. But I think that the, the, the facts are the same for all of us. I think the design is a better inference from the exact same facts that other people would say, no, I see evolution in those. Well, you gotta, I both have a responsibility argue for why we think that's the best inference. That doesn't help much, but if you want to ask a follow-up, I'll be happy. Yeah, I know, I can, this is dying, huh? Yeah, well, this, uh, Clint, if we do... Check. Oh, good, we're good. What's your name? Uh, this is all right. My name is Rachel. Are you afraid to get close to that microphone, Rachel? Yeah, I didn't want to like scream in it. Scream in it, okay. Would, like, Everyone in the entire building knows seat. Rachel's here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, my question earlier, you talked about human beings have moral obligations to other human beings. Yes. And well, persons. Persons have obligation to persons. Okay. So it's personhood. Go ahead. Okay. Because that's, that's a little um, so bit different, right? So it's a more encompassing. Okay, then I guess I would wonder what you mean by personhood, and I would also wonder what you think of the moral obligations, if you think there are any at all, if you think persons have moral obligations to other living beings. Right, so it would be a matter of personhood, and I think that, that we could argue about which in the animal kingdom, where does personhood step in? 
we would probably, you and I would probably say, well, a person, honey, I got a dog. I got a dog. I have the best dog in the world. You guys think you have dogs? They're all junk compared to my dog. <laughs> Seriously. I don't know what you guys have. Crummy dogs, I guarantee you. <laughs> what's, what's the best dog in the room? Raise your hand quick, 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 quick. Best dog, go. Uh, to the lab. A lab. Okay, labs are the stupidest dogs in the entire <laughs> world. Are, are, am I right? They are dumb. Go. Australian Shepherd. Australian Shepherd. We put an Australian on it, so it's important. <laughs> no, it's just a shepherd. It's a dumb dog. I have a Welsh Pembroke Corgi. <laughs> now, is that a person? Is Bailey a person? So we might say, well, where does, what do we mean by personhood? Because we have obligations between persons, and I get that. But you and I might say, well, okay, that rat that ran across the room, is that a person? I or, would say no. Well, okay, so then we got to figure, okay, so that's good. How about like ants? Are ants persons? I would also say no. Okay, fine. So we would say there are some living creatures that are, are they sentient? Uh, do they have free agency? I don't, maybe, I, see where all these things come in? We have to figure out where on the spectrum and then what criteria we're using for personhood. Um, right? Because you would say something between a cat and the mouse, there's some dividing line there when it comes to, per if you think a cat is a person. Do you? I do not think a cat is a person. You don't like cats? <laughs> That's I not what either. I said. <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. I have a cat, okay? Kick the cat out of the house. I hate that cat. Okay, but would you say dogs have personhood? No. Okay, so where would you have in the animal kingdom personhood? Human beings. And that would stop there, right? Um, Nothing below human beings. No other animal in, in the universe has personhood. I'm just probing I don't where think you're I at. understand what you mean by person. Okay, got That's it. So, what... so exactly. So 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 I would say I have a I have an idea of personhood that is biblical. That's where I draw it from. And that's why I do oh. think that the biblical worldview does help us in certain ways because otherwise these lines are rather arbitrary. I uh, I mean I don't know if you, how you feel about that, but so I think that what we would say is, yeah. as a Christian, I would say, well, yes, we're designed in the image of God in a way that's unique from other animals. And what we mean by yeah. image of God we were image bearers in some way. You know, that's something we can debate about. I've written about it online. You know, it has something to do with our free agency. Some of the things that we know we have, our mind, these are things that we get that are in the image of God that we would say are unique to humans. As an atheist, I would have said, well, no, those are just a product of evolutionary progress, and you are the, the, the best thinking of all the primates, and that's why you think you're special. But uh, using a biblical standard, I would say, no, humans are special because they're in the image of God. And we have these inalienable rights because we are in God's image. So that's how I would respond as a Christian. But some people so, would say, that, but would even I'm not sure that's, why, that's where you were coming from. Some people would argue that animals, lower forms of animals, dogs, for example, have, are, have, are persons. And that we have moral obligations to them because of their personhood. There are some animals you probably don't feel bad about killing. Um. <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, how about I this? I don't feel you, bad. Well, I mean, you wouldn't have a problem setting a mouse trap if you've got a mouse problem, would you? I think there are other ways you could go about that. Okay, like <laughs> we just channel him out of the house, or I, I'm not sure how he. We don't can't poison him though, right? I so think I just you're think you're trying just, to get me to say no, no, I'm not trying to get. No, I'm not really trying to. I'm just saying there's a spectrum, right? So if we we say, well, it's beyond animals. It's just about um, living beings. There's lots of insects you don't mind killing, right? You don't try to save every mosquito that's biting you. You swat it. <laughs> I know what you mean. Okay, so we're, we're all trying to draw distinctions on where it is that we think life has is somehow different enough from us that we don't have certain moral obligations to it. That's all I'm saying. And I think, as, yeah. so I'm using a biblical source. Now, we can argue, there's been lots of theological, I mean, for 2,000 years, we've had arguments about the personhood of animals. Will there be pets and animals in, in heaven? Or, I mean, this is an argument that's been is classically made by the church fathers. So I think there's ways to kind of split that debate. And so I, I don't know, I'm not really sure where I, I've, I've fallen on both sides of that theological debate. I don't think it's important. It's not an essential. Of the personhood what, what of ha, what other has, living Yes, things. what other living things have personhood. In other words, what other living things have personhood that would require from us a moral obligation? I see. So... I guess I'm asking, what is your stance on that? Okay, so my stance, I'll, this is, I'll answer this last question, and then we'll, we'll hop in for a follow-up <laughs> later. But my stance on that is that I think that stewardship of our environment only makes sense under a biblical worldview. 
Because under an evolutionary worldview, a naturalistic worldview, why would I feel bad that I eliminate weaker species? Especially if it helps this species to thrive. And don't tell me that, oh yeah, every species on the planet has to be in absolute equal equilibrium in order for us to survive. We are here now through a rich history of destruction through evolutionary processes, which, in which we, as the smartest species, rose to the top by killing everything else. So under that model, I don't know why I would feel a certain stewardship to my environment, but under a biblical model, we have, were told that we were put here to steward the environment. So I do feel that obligation as a Christian in a way I didn't feel before as an atheist. I didn't care what species of owl in California is gonna to have to be eliminated so we can irrigate this land and have more corn crops. I couldn't care less. But now I get it. I'm here to steward all of this. I'll answer more after the, let's come back around and come back to the second question, thanks. What's your name? Brian. Brian, good to meet you. You as well. Um, thanks for coming to Columbus. You were great at XSI as well. Oh, thanks. Yes. Um, so are you familiar with the Euthyphro dilemma? Yes. Okay. So, so for those who may not uh, kind of, and everyone I talk to about this has a different way of parsing it out. So sure. parse it out for everyone and then we'll try to respond to it. Sure. The way um, I've learned about it is that if there are, if God is the moral, hmm, how do I say it? I'm going to butcher this. If God is the moral source for our morals, um, does he have a reason, yes or no? If the answer is no, then he's illogical and therefore he's not perfect. If the answer is yes, then his reasoning is the uh, higher standard for morality. If that, would you say I'd, I hit that on the head? The yeah, so here's how I typically would struggle with before. Okay, so look, if, it's, if all moral truths are simply proclamations of God, mm -hmm. then God could easily change his mind on certain things and they would no longer be morally virtuous or morally vile. If, in other words, if rape is only wrong because God said it is so, mm -hmm. well then God could change his mind, right? And mm -hmm. it could be okay. Doesn't seem right, right? Or, or maybe what it is is that no, rape is wrong and God understands and recognizes this principle and simply transmits it to us well, if that's the case, we can take God out of the process. If rape is wrong, transcendently, we don't need God to tell us. We can find it some other way. Yeah. So you have two choices. Either he's the source of moral truth, in which case it seems kind of like willy-nilly. He could change his mind. Or he's simply the transmitter of moral truth, in which case he could step out of the way and we could still know moral truth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the two dilemmas, right, this, this problem. But that's not what Christians believe anyway. I mean, our view is that he's not the source. He's not creating moral law. He's not sitting down one night and going, okay, I gotta do 10 commandments by tomorrow. Okay, let's think, first commandment. And he writes it down. And he's not also saying, I know there are these 10 commandments, now I just need to make sure I articulate them well to my people. He's not doing that either. What we would say is that no, his nature, he is by his very nature the source of moral truth. It's just an expression of his nature. He doesn't create this. It's just a reflection of his moral nature. If you put salt in water, you get salty water. Take the salt out, you have no salty water. Because we're in a universe governed by God, we have moral obligations, we sense the universe is salty. Mm -hmm. Take out the God, take out the salt, it's no longer salty. So we would say that moral truths are simply a reflection of his nature. They're simply what happens when God is in a universe, it becomes filled with his nature and then we sense these obligations. It also becomes filled with his logical nature and we also have those same logical constructs because mm -hmm. that salt is also in the water. Yes. So that's how I would answer that. Perfect. Makes sense? Okay, yep. sure. Sure. What's your name? I'm Daniel. Daniel, um, good to meet you. All right, so this is about the idea of evidence then. Yes. Um, do you think the church has failed providing evidence to Oh, they want you to get closer to them so the Sorry. whole world can hear you. Oh, great. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah great. All right. So do you think that the church has failed providing evidence to the Christians and uh, congregations and such? And um, do you think that's what's creating a very weak faith or a lack of a uh, strong Christian? Well, all we can do is look at surveys to kind of see if that's true. I, I know this. When I became a Christian, I want you to imagine this little uh, uh, thought picture for a second. Imagine you're an alien, and you're coming into our universe, and you're approaching Earth, and your adjutant, another alien, says to you, hey, we're going to get to Earth in a minute, and when we get there, uh, you're going to meet some people called Christians. And if you want to know what they're like, I have a book, 
and he hands you the book, and here's their Bible, and you read the Bible as an alien, never been to planet Earth, and you go, okay, I've read the Bible cover to cover, I get it, I now know what Christians are like. And then you got here, and you, you met people in the church, or you saw how we're doing church, do you think any of this would be what you expected to find if all you had to start with was this Bible? I don't think so. So I was the, that alien at 35. I had never been in a church in my entire life until I stepped foot, except for like a funeral or a wedding, until I stepped foot in that first church. And this guy provoked me, this pastor, he said, oh, Jesus is a smart guy, smartest man who ever lived. As a matter of fact, all of our moral teaching in America is really based on a Judeo-Christian ethic that Jesus of Nazareth advocated in just a couple of sermons. And I said, okay, really? So I bought a Bible to see if that was true. And I thought everyone became a Christian the way that I did by looking through all the scriptures and looking at it evidentially. Of course, no one becomes a Christian that way. So now, I don't know that this is going to solve whatever problems that are ailing the church. I don't know. But I know when you ask young people, people between, say, 17 and 30, that's still young to me, 30, it's pretty sad. But if you ask them, why did you leave the church, they will tell you in their own words. And the categories break into lots of statements about intellectual skepticism and a few claims about hypocrisy. There are claims that people will make leaving the church to say, hey, Christians are hypocrites. But they're about, only about 20% of the complaints. Like 80% are is intellectual skepticism. So I think that if, we, you know, uh, again, is that really where they, is that really why they left? I don't know if that's really why they left. That's what they're telling me. I would like to be able to address those issues. So is, is the church doing this enough? Probably not. I, mean, I think you guys already know the question, the answer to that. If the first time you're having these kinds of thoughts and conversations about your faith is when you're listening to a speaker who's talking about making a case for your faith, if you haven't been hearing that in your church every single time you guys meet, then probably we're not doing enough. Yeah, thanks. My name is Stephen. Stephen. And we want to thank you for coming to Central Ohio. Oh, sure. You've had a, a great impact on, on this area. And um, <clears throat> I've read your books. Great work. Oh, thanks. Uh, two of them. And even the children's one. <laughs> oh, cool. But, um, you know, I have a fun question and okay. a mystery. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, God values our faith, and we live a, a life of faith. We don't see God, uh, and we exercise, and he gives us situations, you know, to uh, become stronger and stronger, and um, that's a mystery to me, and I, I'm eagerly awaiting, you know, uh, <clears throat> the ray of eternity, what is that? I think that faith will be carried over into the next life. And um, have you thought about that? And what is that going to look like? I, uh, it seems like faith is like, um, you know, God, trusting God, but yet independent and creativity and he desires for us to move on our own in many, many ways, but have a faith base. Okay, I'll, I'm going to answer that. Let me, let me ask you, this. I'll, I'll answer any follow-up in a second, so let me let the guy behind you also get a chance real quick. And I'll answer that question for you for sure, Stephen, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I need to define what I talk about when I talk about faith, first of all. He may have raised a good question about faith. Will there be faith in eternity? So I always look at it this way. Beliefs, I think, are categorized in three categories. One, you can have some beliefs that are unreasonable. If you think you get warts from frogs, we have science now that tells you how you get warts. You don't get warts from frogs. If you believe you get warts from frogs, you hold an unreasonable belief because it's actually a belief in something in spite of evidence to the contrary. If you hold a belief that's blind, you just don't know if it's true or not, you just always accepted it as true, well then you hold a blind belief because you hold a belief even though you have no evidence for or against this thing. Or you can have what I call a forensic belief, which is a belief that is what you believe to be true in light of the evidence you have even though you can't answer every question. Faith is the same way. You can have an unreasonable faith, a blind faith, or a forensic faith. What I mean by that is, is that in every trial I've ever worked, I have not been able to answer the questions that the jury wants me to answer. 
I've had cases where the guy killed his wife, he got rid of the body, and then he claimed that she ran off. And I couldn't tell the jury how he killed her, when he killed her, where he killed her, how he got rid of the body, how he even moved her car. I couldn't answer any of those important questions. They still found him guilty, even though they had unanswered questions. So in other words, they took a step of trust based on the evidence we did have, even though they had open questions. That is the kind of faith that I think we have as Christians. Now, I don't think we'll have that after we're on that dot that leads us into eternity, because the question will be resolved. I won't have to make an inference from evidence. And by the way, this is exactly what Jesus of Nazareth asked for his hearers. He said, if you don't believe what I'm saying to you, at least believe on the evidence of these miracles. Really? You don't want us to believe this blindly? No. I'm going to do some stuff in front of you first, then if that should demonstrate it. And when John the Baptist had problems in his own faith and sent his disciples, because John was in custody, and his disciples went to John and said, hey, is it Jesus rather, and said, Jesus, John just sent us. He wants to know, are you the one? Think of what Jesus could have said to John. He could have said, hey, are you kidding me? John's asking this question. John, my cousin, who leapt in the womb when our mothers met, John who baptized me, that John, who's all his disciples are now my disciples, that's the John who now is wondering if I'm, really? You tell him to go have some more faith. You tell him to go pray about this. You tell him to suck it up. He could have said a number of things. Instead, he said, no problem, hang on. He worked three miracles in front of John's disciples. He said, go back and tell John what you just saw. That's a very evidential approach to asking us to believe something even though you have open questions. I've never asked a jury to render a verdict in which I knew they didn't have huge open questions that they were never going to get answered. I couldn't even answer them afterwards when we would meet after the trial. I don't know the answer to those questions. But they still render verdicts. They take a step of trust in light of the evidence. That's the kind of step I think we're asked to take as believers. Look, there is more than enough evidence to reasonably infer that God exists. But there's also more than enough wiggle room for you to deny He exists. There just is. That's the way every case is. That's why jury selection is the most important thing we do. Because if you don't want it to be true, you'll find a way to wiggle around. It's fine. I think that God leaves it that way so that your decision is not compelled. He's a gentleman that way. He's not going to force you in, give you more than enough evidence, but there'll be some open questions you have, and you have to make a decision if you can traverse the open questions given the evidence. So I don't think we'll have that kind of faith in the next life because I think all the questions will have been answered. Let me get the next question and I'll come back to you. All right, here you got a follow-up, good. Hello again, sir. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so I think this has a lot to tie with what you kind of have just said, so it may already have been answered, but you mentioned in your two, the two points that you brought up, the second one being you know, the evil. Yes. And I remember what you said earlier about, like, let's say you have seven pieces of evidence, but one critical piece that proves yes. otherwise. Yes. Uh, so in that case, for the second piece of evidence, for mm -hmm. almost a justification of evil, mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of that justification ties to an afterlife. And then the yes. afterlife itself, like, is justified by the existence of God. It seems a little bit circular. And if, mm -hmm. if we can't, and this is the blind belief that you talked about, right. if you can't, like, prove the existence mm -hmm. of an afterlife, is it fair to say that the rest of the evidence holds and therefore God exists? Right, okay, so let me answer that question. Um, so let's take a look at, uh, for me it's not so much an, an afterlife, God says there's an afterlife, so therefore there's an afterlife. It's that I think that we have good reason to believe that the material life we live, the material existence we experience in the universe is not all there is. Okay. So that's where I, that, that's the case. If the, our material existence is not all there is, if there is an immaterial reality about the universe, this opens up some other options. One of which would be that we are not going to live in a purely material life. So I think evidence for mind and consciousness kind of point in this direction. I think even Thomas Nagel, somebody mentioned, uh, the atheist who thinks there's problem, fun, f foundational problems with uh, material evolution because he doesn't believe that it accounts for the immaterial experiences of mind that we experience, even rationality. We cannot get this, he believes, and I think he's right, from a purely evolutionary material process. So that opens up the door to an immaterial experience that we would all have. And since we're having this material experience now, I think we have to at least consider the possibility, and this is the claim. So again, if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the problem is, Epicurus says he's shaking his fist at this notion of God that he thinks that we hold, well, then you at least have to be fair and shake your fist at the entire notion of God that we hold. 
Because the entire notion of God we hold is the God of an afterlife who's promised us a life with him in eternity. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the equation. You can't say, well, I'm going to ignore five attributes of God so I can shake my fist at the other two. Okay. Keep in mind that the God you're complaining about is offered is, is, is more than what you've just described him. Okay. It's, so that's why I think it's fair for us to include that because that's the God he's shaking his fist at. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. All right, the man with the voice. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that's right. <laughs> I want to uh, go back and circle around on the um, theological question again, but yes. more on the historical one sure. that you said we could maybe uh, yeah. divulge a little bit in the Q&A section. So yeah. um, what, I guess briefly, what is the best historical evidence? You can, I think this is a good question for the audience as a whole. What's the best historical evidence you can give for the Christian faith? The best historical? I'm not a big fan of that word historical. So what I look at, remember, everything we work in cold cases, we're working, any crime you work, you're working an event in the past. We don't get to watch crimes in live time. We don't, we're not like, a, like scientists who work in a laboratory environment with crime. We are always examining events. I guess you could call them historical events, even if it's only 30 years ago or it's only 30 minutes ago. So what we're looking at is do we have any good evidence that would so, – so for example, if we're – the first thing I wanted to know when I was looking at the New Testament is could I reasonably consider the Gospels to be a reliable eyewitness record? That's up for debate, and people will debate that for, for ages, okay? And I've written a ton about this in both my books and on the website. And what I try to argue is that I think we've got good reason to at least suggest that the authors of this account wanted it to be considered an eyewitness account. We have statements like John at the end of his account where he says, hey, I, you know, I'm writing about all that Jesus did. I could write a lot more. I could fill books with all this stuff. Okay. Then the question is, well, then is, is it a reliable account? Is it an account, an eyewitness account, and then is it a reliable account? And if it's a reliable account, this is, this is how, by the way, I look at, I get supplemental reports from 30 years ago in which a witness has been interviewed by a detective in 1972. Now, that witness has been dead for 10 years, so I have no way to go re-interview that person. And the detective has been dead for five. So now I have no way to go interview the writer of the report, but I've got this report I have to assess even though I have no access to the first eyewitness or the person who wrote about the eyewitness, that's much like the Gospels. Well, I know how to assess those reports. There's four factors. I talk about them in cold case. Four factors we use to assess eyewitness reliability of any document, of any eyewitness. So those four areas are the four areas that I pressed into service as I examined the Gospels. So uh, for me, remember, when someone asks you, what is the one reason why you believe this to be true, I'm always a little bit hesitant because I never have one reason. I call this death by a thousand paper cuts. That's what it is. It's this cumulative case of, of hundreds of little things that I think point to the most reasonable inference. And any one of those things is a paper cut. I could offer it to you, and I think you could be very reasonably say, well, that doesn't seem like enough. It's not enough. It's the fact it's cumulative. It wouldn't be enough in a jury trial either. But when I get a hundred of these things, juries convict because there's no, there's no other reasonable alternative. And that's what I tried to do with Cold Case Christianity. That book is really about looking at the historical evidence for the reliability of the New Testament. I know that's not going to give you much. So I'll, no, no, I, it was me. give me a it's chance to good. recite 48,000 words, and I can give it to you right now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> Thank you, sir. It. Appreciate you. Hi, what's your name? My name is Frank Eubanks. Uh, one factor, there are people who are atheists, uh, they may say, what difference does it make if there is a, uh, if there is a God because uh, the life that they live is not good enough to, uh, to go to heaven? Uh, uh, Fragrance like, like me, uh, I thought the Jehovah's Witness religion is an excellent Christian religion, but I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness because I do not want to live under their restrictive life scale style. I'd rather mm -hmm. be a member of a religious group that allow me to live uh, the way I want to live, put it that way. Right. And uh, if uh, the, a lot of people, they would say, uh, if there is a God, uh, the way I've lived my life is not good enough to uh, go to heaven. Uh, the things I've done is too bad for uh, for me uh, to be forgiven, and 
so uh, what difference does it make if there is a God? If, if there was, if there is a God, I'm not going to heaven anyway because I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Uh, I don't want to join a church because I, the church is too restrictive. I would not be able to do what I do right. now. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, that, that, that's the basic thing. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you for, for that. Uh, let me just put it this way to you guys. I had a partner who would uh, I had for 10 years, and he would always say this to me. He would say, Jim, if there's a good God in a good heaven, I'm going to be there because I'm a good guy. I mean, we, we, aren't, we aren't the bad guys. We're the ones putting the bad guys in jail. And he would say, I say, well, here's the problem, Rick. Um, as a Christian, I don't believe, I don't see my God as a good God, right? I mean, he's all-powerful. That means if he's all-powerful, he has the power to eliminate moral imperfection. That's what all-powerful means. So that means we're not worshiping a good God. We, we believe there's a perfect God. I get it. You're a good guy. Great. Are you perfect? Because the standard isn't good. <laughs> because God is not just good. He's all-powerful. He's perfect. He's morally perfect. If that's the case, the problem we have is not a, about, about effort or about his lack of goodness. Is that we're trying? To, is, uh, none of us are perfect. On my best day, I'm not perfect. And so that's why I think this notion of God that Christianity offers is actually... It solves a bigger problem because Rick has always thought that there's a good God, and that's all we worship. We don't. We all worship a perfect God. Last question of the night right here. What's your name? Jason. Jason, you're reading a question. I'm, I'm afraid of it already. Go ahead. No, I'd right. like to collect my thought before good, I good. speak. Um, I'm going to start this with a supposition Okay. Uh, from biblically. Uh, Israel's enemies did live by enough of a code to at mm -hmm. least build a community, so there yep. was some, some moral uh, uh, compass that yes. they live by, uh, but probably not the moral code we live by today. Um, therefore, we mm -hmm. could suppose that they weren't necessarily evil unless there was evidence that they were evil, and inferring evil to something that we don't understand would have the danger of being ignorant. So therefore, the fact that we live by Judeo-Christian values today, isn't that just moral relativism? sure why that would follow, but a couple things. Remember, everything's built on a presupposition, right? If the, if the presupposition is wrong, then everything collapses, right? It's, it's, the, it's the moral code that won. Well, okay, so, so if this is the, okay, so how do you know this is the, so you think the Judeo, uh, rephrase your question then, make sure I get it right. Is, isn't conforming to Judeo-Christian values uh -huh. moral relativism? Well, I mean, what we would do As is... As opposed the, to a culture that was defeated. Okay, well, let's just go back to, um, this, uh, first let's talk about the culture that was defeated. Mm -hmm. So if we were assuming that they actually, you're saying that this is, for all we know, this is a very nice culture that was doing nice things, and we're just the victims. They were an enemy. They are Canaanite. Right, okay. So first of all, I, I, I would look at it this way. I'm not quite sure I understand your question. So if you're saying that, that, that this is, there's only a couple of options for moral codes. One, they are the product of subjects, either individuals or groups. Right, that's one possible source of moral truth. The other, that it's just the evolutionary result these are the principles that beings, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but this is another possibility, right? That these are just the evolutionary result. If we learn to live this way, mm -hmm. we are the ones that survived with this particular code. But to be honest, we aren't the ones that, we share the world with lots of other uh, codes. Right. Even now, we share the world with lots of other codes. So if we're suggesting that, if, if we believe that this is just the code that happened to emerge, and so therefore we embrace this code, but do we think then we have no right then to speak against any other code that we see in the, in the world? Because if that's the case, we'd have no right then, right? We would say, hey, we just happen to be, the, uh, we happen to be supporting the, the moral code of the victor group, who happens to now live in America. <laughs> Well, there's other groups in UK and in Pakistan right. and in Africa and in different places that have different moral codes mm -hmm. in China. So the question is then, okay, so we're comfortable saying then that we cannot speak to the appropriate behavior of any other group, right? Because all we're saying, I think that, that, that we, we might have it wrong, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that there is an objective transcendent code that sits above all of these things. Except that that's so a the question that becomes well. No, what I mean is, do you, okay? Let's ask the question then. Or are you willing then to say uh, that all we happen to be in possession of is the code that won? So therefore, it's not necessarily true or, or good or bad. Mm -hmm. It's just the code that won. But we're not. We're actually probably in the minority of people of the planet who holds this code the way we hold it. Sure. So are we unwilling then to say that? 
So we would say, hey, whatever you're doing over there, whatever you're doing to, to Americans in your custody, whatever you're doing to Christians in your custody, whatever you're doing to Muslims in your population, we're not going to say anything about it because we don't think it's good or bad. There is no good or bad. There's just whatever's working for you as the victor group. I don't think you're willing to do that. No, oh, no, 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 no. No, and I'm not either. <laughs> okay, so then the question becomes, okay, so, so whether or not the code we might have happens to be the victor group has nothing to say about whether or not it's true or not or it's the code. It may very well be that the victor group happens to have the code. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't know that, right? God but, said he was good. Right, and but therefore yeah, forget. He's good. But, right, I agree with you, but but I mean, I'm with you on that issue. But but just for the sake of argument, mm -hmm. but it is, just because your group happens to have survived with this code does not mean it's only true because your group has it. Well, that's actually my question. Right. So it may very well be that your group has the true code. The code that has an objective transcendent foundation because your group has decided to bend its knee to the objective transcendent source. Now, your, your group might win in the end, but we haven't really. But let's just say we did, and now the whole population of the entire planet is, is Christians. Well, it doesn't mean that that's just a relativistic answer to morals. It may just be that the group that happened to win happened to also embrace the code that came from the objective moral source of, mor of truth. Does that make sense? It does. So, so I, you know, but if someone said to you, well, how do you know that you're just, I don't think that that's the case. If that was the case, then we would never be able to complain about any other culture okay, and the behavior of any other culture. And we do that all the time. Even someone like Sam Harris who argues that really what you're seeing here is there, he believes in objective, transcendent, moral truths, but he grounds them in the transcendent, objective nature of human beings. That is the group that's common to all of us. Right. That transcends any small people group. The species transcends that. And he says, we do those things that aid in human flourishing. But of course, the problem is the loaded word flourishing. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. People will disagree about what they mean by what causes a group to flourish, a species sure. to flourish. Some might say, no, that's a bad definition of flourishing. This is a good definition of flourishing. That means there has to be a standard above those two definitions that you're judging good from bad. Now you're stuck with me again. See the problem? I don't think you can ever avoid the problem that we have to have an objective standard by which we even judge those kinds of proclamations. And I don't think that Harris thinks flourishing means survival. Because people do all kinds of bad things and aid in their own survival. We have, we're here right now because our people groups at some point in the past killed everybody who was in competition with them. So we are here as a result of some pretty bad behavior that's somewhere in our own uh, historical past. So survival can be aided by bad behavior. But that's not what he means, of course. But then he has to steal a concept of righteous living, flourishing, that he doesn't have yet because that's the code that we're talking about. Anyway. Up the house a little bit. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. I'll be in the back for a few questions at the end if you want. Okay? Thanks. Thank